Welcome to Warhorse. I just want to say, let's have a great shoot. God bless us one and all. Cheers. All of my stalwart family members covering so many movies all made this movie with me. Joanna Johnson's done costumes so often for me, and Rick Carter has done so many production designs for films I've directed, and of course Janusz Kaminski and his entire crew. It was just a great experience to have everybody back together again. Action. I was not prepared for the Moors in Dartmoor, Devon. I wasn't prepared for the beautiful desolation the Moors have to offer. It used to be just tall, proud trees, and it was deforested hundreds of years ago and never grew back. Now it's just desolate, rocky hills. But then every variety of sky you can imagine came pouring over, and I'd see a sky on its way, and I'd go, quick, now we're gonna to go to scene 7A, forget we're shooting 4B, we're going to 7A, here come the clouds we need, you know, and bang, the crew is so mobile and fluid, we could quickly shoot something that allowed nature to help tell the story. Dartmoor was predominantly cold, <laughs> but it's a beautiful, beautiful place. Everywhere you turn the camera, there was just another gorgeous shot. When we were down there scouting, out in the middle of nowhere, there was an old ruin that had been there for a long, long time. There was a sort of a derelict partial building that we found that we made into the farmhouse. It's one of those places where the landscape just speaks to you. England is one of my favorite countries to work in because you get these beautiful pastures with all little villages and churches and thick patches of sand that quickly move across the landscape. So it's very visually stimulating. All right, here we go. Now it's stand by the ship. The village was offered to us as almost a movie set in waiting. When I first got to Castle Coombe and looked around, I said, was this built for tourists? But no, it's a beautiful little village. You don't really relate to it as a place you've ever seen before. It was the perfect place for both the purchase of Joey and also a place for those boys blithely going off to war thinking they'd be home by Christmas, which everybody thought when they signed up to fight in France and it turned out to be a four-year entrenched war of attrition. We made probably 85% of the costumes of this film. My military group get more excited than life itself about something like this. We don't think there's been anything of the First World War of this sort of scale for a while, so that's been very thrilling. All right, gentlemen, listen here. The officers would have had their clothes made for them to conform to the conventions, but they all had different cloths and slightly different colors, and so if you really look closely, there's a lot of detail. There's an elegance to the costumes. Joanna was saying how they were really gentlemen first and soldiers second. I think there is something quite heroic and extraordinary about men riding into battle on horses. But I think there is a massive amount of vanity that went with all of that. Roll sound, please. Roll and slating. The cavalry charge made me think differently about the whole movie because Stephen had an image in his mind about reeds blowing a little bit of pollen and out of it come these soldiers that rise up and now they're gonna move from that idyllic backlit image all the way across into the field and then through a camp and then into a dark forest. I think that transition is really the beginning of the journey into the darkness. Rick Carter was allowed to build some of his sets on the Wellington estate thousands of beautiful acres in England, and we were able to go there and shoot so much of the picture. Well, this is very much old-fashioned filmmaking. It's the First World War. Uh, we're dealing with beautiful costumes. We're dealing with beautiful composition. You've got great landscape. You've got hundreds of extras. Nobody makes movies like that anymore but Steven Spielberg. It was interesting because Janusz found a way to capture an overall feeling and look. It was quite a challenge because we go from this bucolic, lush landscape into all sense of color dissipating. Well, the third act, you arrive in no man's land, and now it's absolutely barren of life. Of all the work he did on War Horse, this was the most extraordinary thing. Rick Carter found an old airfield. He took that flat, flat land and he turned it into no man's land, 1917. Action, boys! Action! 
Crossing No Man's Land was, for me, the best part of the film. Purely from the sense that you got of what it must have been like. With Stephen, everything that can be real seems to be real. It's important making a movie like this to try to capture the reality of all the different sides of the war. What Joanna was doing with the costumes and what Rick was doing with the set design really gives the movie quite an amazing look. It doesn't hurt to have the likes of Steven Spielberg, who is extraordinary at taking a limited number of resources and making it look huge. I really wanted to make War Horse because I really think it says a lot about courage. The courage of this boy and what he endures and what he overcomes. And it's also about the courage of this extraordinary animal. And that was the underlying subliminal theme that I think informs every frame of Warhorse.